great, great conversation about, uh, I'm going to continue this week with uh, where we uh, began last week, with talking about Jesus and his personal evangelism, him communicating with people, and looking at some different observations of that sort of thing. And so let me uh, jump back here. I'll begin in prayer, and then we'll get into the word, but I want to kind of segue from last week, a few things. But Lord, I do thank you this morning. Um, it's great to be with brothers and sisters and to really reflect on what you did in real history and time. And may we learn from it, Lord. You gave us your word. You gave us what we wanted for a purpose. And may we see it and glean from it. We can only touch on things here, you know, Lord. But I pray you'd stir our heart and our minds. I pray you'd cre um, stir our creativity, who you've made us to be. May we be thinking of people. May we be very per um, specific individuals as we go through these reality narratives that you've given us. And so I look forward to how you'll bring it alive to us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, last week we began, um, I began just kind of looking at how Jesus interacted with what we called religious people, you know, just as a category, you know, and he pursued his disciples. And these were guys that had a background. Again, they had religious ideas. They had already repented. They were hanging out with John. So they saw this coming Messiah. They saw their sin. And of course, Jesus initiated and pursued them and called upon them to follow him. Follow him. Is there a ringing in here? Do I need to do something different? No? Okay. I can just hear. <laughs> so anyway, uh, obviously there was that. And then there was Nicodemus who actually came to Jesus, right, as a religious guy. And same sort of thing. He had these religious pieces, and he was seeking out and searching. And, of course, by the end of the Gospels, we see that, that Nicodemus really had a conversion. You know, something really happened there. And how that all happened in his life, we don't have all those details. But just some thoughts we're looking here this morning as we kind of jump in. Just this summary. You know, this we're looking for Jesus' sheep. You know, we'll, we'll emphasize that probably throughout this class. You know, his sheep are out there. And I think I've said to you, there's this old statement that was like, uh, when you talk to people, Jesus' sheep will leave their uh, lift their heads. The rest will go on eating grass. And there's a part of evangelism is we're just looking for Jesus' sheep. We're just, we're out there talking. We're looking for people to pop their heads up, you know. Far less about an argument with people and far more about looking for sheep. Um, religious people have knowledge or, pe I called it knowledge pieces, that become the doorway to talk about the gospel. I talked about that last week. There's already like these pieces in place. So whether it's the Muslim who's thinking about God and the Quran and different things, and as you study that, you go, oh, there's some doorways. Uh, I, I brought up Roman Catholicism. There's, there's doorways. Some com conversations over, the, over my lifetime in evangelism, we would call that pre-evangelism. There's a sense in which there's this pre-evangelism that's already occurred in people's lives. I read some lyrics for you last week. In fact, we talked about them in our small group a little bit. You know, here are these guys wrestling with addiction and alcoholism and their struggle. They're calling their struggle. They even use the word hell, right? Sometimes people obviously are using that as a swear word, but it's a doorway. Somebody's saying, hey, life is really miserable. This is really hard. And then you think about how often Jesus talked about hell. I mean, it's this perfect doorway. I said, I heard you say this, you know, and you can say that to people. You know, what do you, what do you mean by that? How, life is difficult. Life is suffering. Why is that? See how that all of a sudden opens the door right into the gospel. You get to talk about sin. You get to talk about the justice of God. And Jesus talked about a wide gate and a narrow gate. You see, it's just these are doorways that God puts out there. And they're in people's lives. So you, those lyrics talked about God, God and Jesus and the Bible. And they're, they're, they're probably confused about some of it. But there's pieces, right? So they're doorways. So you look for that with religious people. Some of these pieces can actually be helpful, as I said, while some can be bypassed in getting to the heart of the gospel conversation. Like with Nicodemus, he didn't spend a lot of time. In fact, Jesus didn't spend any time that we have here, right, talking about the, you know, the priest and the sacrifices. He just got to the heart of the matter, bypassed a bunch of it. Um, acknowledging qualities in a person shows respect of their God-given humanity. We've been talking about that. You'll see that over and over. Jesus pe treated people with great dignity. He acknowledged, yes, you have this place, or, or even acknowledged the, the rich young ruler, if you remember that. He's kind of, kind of bragging about, if you will, about his goodness, and he obeys all the law. Jesus actually acknowledged it. Yeah, you know, compared to most people, you're probably a pretty good guy, but you still got a problem. <laughs> 
You see how he does that? You can actually do that in evangelism with people. Jesus did it all the time. Um, there's no need to debate their moral public standard. You know, they think they're pretty good. You know, probably according to public standards, there's a lot of people that are pretty good, you know. But that's not the point, right? That's not the standard. The standard is God. So the focus is on the gospel, not just as a proposition, but the reality of the person of Jesus. And that's the thing we can get caught up in with, like apologetics in our discussions, is we want to win this argument. You know, some of us like to win, I mean, I even like to win arguments, right? But at the end of the day, it's really not about that, right? It's about pointing people to the living God, to the person of Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus did. It wasn't just a proposition. He was calling people to follow him. And you see that in scripture. It's a fascinating kind of like two ditches. On one hand, Jesus says, and I think it's John 5, 39, says to the Pharisees, you diligently study the scriptures because by them you think you possess eternal life. But the scriptures point to me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. And then you have the rich man and Lazarus, and, uh, and Jesus gives this picture. And he says, uh, you know, the rich man says, hey, if you just send somebody back from the dead, this miracle my family would believe. And he says, listen, if, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to even pay attention if anybody rises from the dead. So you have one ditch. He says, no, this is my word, and to know the word is to know Christ. And on the other hand, you could get caught in some kind of rote proposition. I've got my theology right, and you could miss Jesus. And so our goal in this evangelism and what Jesus was doing is he was calling people to himself, not a concept. Okay, so this week we want to go to a couple other kind of narratives that Jesus did. And you can see here, if you'd open up your Bibles with me. And this obviously is not a full, I was, when I was studying this stuff yesterday, I was thinking, this isn't a full exegetical expository work on this. So we're just trying to highlight some things in these stories. They're familiar stories. And so I kind of want to go through these with you. Um, this is the first one here in John 4, verses 1 through 42. We'll go through as far as we can here. Uh, this is obviously the woman in Samaria, the Samaritan woman as we talk about, okay? And so I'm going to read through here and try to uh, jump through and, and highlight a few things here, okay? So we know the story. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone uh, oh, excuse me, jump, jump back up into verse, uh, I guess I missed it here, verse 1, or excuse me, I'm, I'm looking for something here. Um, yeah, go back to verse 1. Um, I want to get the context because that's important with this gal. Um, when the Lord, yeah, when the Lord knew the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, uh, he left Judea, there we are, uh, verse 3, I'm sorry. Uh, left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to, had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. And being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by, by the well. It was about the sixth hour. That's what I wanted you to catch. So uh, if you guys, you guys know the familiar, are a little familiar, uh, Samaritans and Jews did not get along. You did not even want the, sh the, the shadow of a Samaritan to cross the shadow of a Jewish person. I mean, there was this huge animosity between the two of them. It was not good. And, and so they would avoid Samaria. They would, they would circle all the way around to go to Jerusalem. So to go to Galilee, they would, they would go way out of their way, just to not even pass through Samaria. But Jesus had to go through Samaria. Went right through the heart of a place that Jews would never go. And he's there in the sixth hour, which basically is the middle of the day, and this woman comes down to get water, and that's, that's part of the key. Like, why is she there in the middle of the day? Women usually go there early in the morning. Now, was she there because she was such an outcast and she couldn't go with the rest of the women? Did she go there because she was there to pick up a guy? You know, there's all sorts of discussion there that interpreters have to wrestle with. But the fact is she's at, there at kind of an odd time in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day, to carry water. Not very comfortable. So... He says, give me a drink. And, of course, his, his uh, disciples had gone to the city to buy food. Now we're in verse 9. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? There's the animosity issue. Verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, it starts 
with a common everyday thing. It's water. I mean, just like a cultural custom thing. They're stand, standing there drinking water together, right? And he's able to take that and her questions and notice this very common everyday thing, and he turns it right into a spiritual conversation, right? Just genius. So if you know the gift of God, okay, uh, verse 11, she said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us this well and drank of it himself with his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give shall never thirst. But the water I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Now there's a lot there in the original language. Because when it says everyone who drinks this water will thirst again, it's the idea of eternal thirst, like thirst, thirst, thirst. I don't know why that's jumping around. Was that just jumping around? J.D.? I don't know why it's doing that, so. It's showing up there differently than it's. We don't know? Okay. Okay, we'll live with it. Sorry, I just watched this thing. It was literally. <laughs> so anyway, the point is, is that even this, this language that's being given here is the idea that you're going you're gonna to continue have to thirst all the way into a dark eternity. And you're never going to be satisfied is actually the kind of the context here. And he says, but I'm going to give you water that will literally well up to eternal life. See the contrast? And the woman says to Jesus, sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. And he said to her, go call your husband and come here. All right? So he's exposing something, isn't he? The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you have now is not your husband. This you have said truly. So he exposes her, but there's a sense in which he exposes her that he doesn't, uh, he doesn't make it more than it needs to be. He gets to the point, she sees it, she sees her failure, and he's got it. I mean, he's nailed it. And so the woman said to her, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. So she gets the fact that he sees something in her. Wow, what is this? Our fathers worship in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is now, or hour is coming, and now is, okay, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. So what she does there a little bit, again, you know, the, you can't make a full argument from silence. She could be really inquiring about this religious idea in her mind. On the other hand, and again, it's, when we're dealing with the narrative, we're trying to think, what's going on here? She may be diverting this, because remember, he's, he's pointing out her sin. And she acknowledges it, but that's probably pretty uncomfortable, right? She's, she's got shame. She knows she's wrong. It's not good. Maybe, again, she came to the well water because she can't come in the morning. So you think about a real woman that's dealing with this stuff, and it would be easy to try to divert that and start talking about something religious, right? And that's what she sort of does. And so, again, it could be a, a genuine inquiry, too. We don't know. But you could see the other side of it, too. She wants to divert it, which is a great lesson in this, right? We could get caught in all sorts of debates with people about all sorts of theological stuff. And we'll get to that when we look at observations. But Jesus just kind of dances around it for the most part. Just, boom, let's get, let's get to the heart of it. And so he, he moves, and, and here's the issue. But an hour is coming, and now is. It's this idea of salvation is right now. We need to deal with this right now. This isn't just some theoretical, theological, abstract idea. We're talking about something here and now that you need to contend with. Right? True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. And when that one comes, he will declare all things. And Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. Right back to the person of Jesus. I'm right here, if you will, in your face, in your space. And whatever you want to talk about over here theologically, what are you going to do with me? 
the Messiah is here. The Christ is here. Right? Fully man, fully God is, in your, is right here. And at this point, his disciples came, and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Okay? That would have been pretty improper, really. You had to be careful about that. You had to have a propriety and a carefulness with that, and we still do. Yet, uh, no one said, what do you seek, or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot. Isn't that interesting? She, she came there with this water pot in the middle of the day. This is why she came. She drops it and heads back to the city. What's that say about her? And when she gets back to the city, what does she say? Come see a man who told me all the things I have done. Come, I'm going to tell you, this is a man. Uh, I have done is the idea of all the things from my past. She literally has a sense that these things are in her past. She's repented. She gets it. She's been converted. That's why she dropped the water pot. That's why she ran back. And what was her first reaction? To tell everybody, right? The natural flow. <clears throat> they went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat. He says, I have food. Let's stop right there in the narrative. <clears throat> but you see what's going on. It's this conversation. He's pointing out her sin in sort of a dignified way, but honest way. She recognizes it. It kind of could get sidetracked. He brings it right back to him. And he says, today is the day. And when she sees it, her eyes are opened. She repents. Looks like repentance. She doesn't even care about the water anymore. And she runs back to the city and tells everybody. And if we follow through with the narrative, it's a wonderful story. Because what ends up happening is all these people come out. And uh, basically, she becomes a witness to this entire city. And all of a sudden, there's tons of people coming that are, that are now coming to faith in Christ because of her. It's a glorious story. Um, I think we have some time here. Um, another story, then, that you, you might be familiar with, which is another one. Let's touch on that just briefly. Um, John chapter 8. This is the adulterous woman <coughs> that, uh, that is brought to Jesus. They want to stone her. Actually, they really want to corner Jesus again. I wish we could do a, you know, you could do a whole study of this because this is really a setup of Jesus. They want to, they want to corner him. And he has a way of dealing with them and her all at the same time again. You know, it's, Jesus is a genius. I mean, it shouldn't shock us, right? But he's like this genius. And I always find it fascinating when I just study him and think about all these little details. Why did he say it that way? And why did he do that thing that way? There, there's reasons for everything. Everything Jesus did is calculated. Every place he went, every, all the timing, if you look at a harmony of the Gospels, the whole thing is a genius orchestrated strategy. And so it's just really fun to study it, and I wish we had more time to do it. But look with me at uh, uh, John 8. So, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him. And he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having, set her in the, and having set her in the center of the court. Okay, so even that, she was caught in adultery. Somebody saw something. Caught in adultery. Uh, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. That's what it says right in the text. Now, in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman, what then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Right? He catches them. He stops them in their tracks. Are you without sin? What about this whole situation? You caught her in the act. The Old Testament law says you are supposed to do something about that, and you haven't done something. There's a whole discussion there that you could have about what they did, what they didn't do, how they were setting him up. And he didn't, he didn't buy into their game. He just simply said, what about your sin? And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone, and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Totally shamed, totally embarrassed, totally in front of him. And then look what he does. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you, condemn you either. Go from now on and sin no more. And again, a very familiar story, right? 
But Jesus is able to deal with this woman's shame. She's in shame. She's facing this judgment. And here he is in the middle of that, able to show her great dignity and care and compassion and mercy, right? And yet still call out her sin. There's something about that that we need to get in our minds. Calling out sin is probably is the most loving thing we can do for people goes to biblical discipline, and it starts right in the beginning of the gospel thing. Have you, I don't know if we thought about that. Showing people their sin, allowing God, the Holy Spirit, to show us our sin, show people their sin, is a gift from God. It's grace, right? I see some of you nodding. It's, it's, it's actually grace. It's a wonderful gift. So there's some observations we can kind of draw from this. So let's just look at some of these. I, uh, now my thing doesn't work. <laughs> Let me try this here. Okay, J.D., I need some help to get this thing to work. Sorry, y'all. Something hung up. Do I hit his? Well, that would work. I can hit this, and that'll work. Hey, can, you, can I get you to... Uh... Let's try again. So we're back looking at our passage, and we're just, I'm just making some general observations. Okay, look. He's the Savior of the world, right? No Jew, no Greek, slave, free, male, female, no people boundaries. He crosses right over all the boundaries, all the ethnic boundaries, race boundaries, all the religious boundaries, right? He crosses them all. What an amazing thing. Proprieties for dealing with the opposite sex. That's obviously, there's clear there. And I would just say there's a warning for all of us in that. We have to be very careful. You know, and truly, when you deal with the, um, you know, I've had chances sitting in a, you know, getting my hair done in a place and having a conversation with a gal cutting my hair and getting a chance. We, we saw a gal come to know the Lord like that years ago. But you have to be really careful with that stuff. You're talking about really intimate stuff with people. <laughs> And so what my general thing is like, you know, I, I might share something with somebody, but then I say, well, I think you really need to talk to my wife about this, you know, <laughs> and I'm immediately giving people my wife's phone number. So, and I, you know, I, I, I only go so far with that, but we do have to be careful with that. And it, Jesus demonstrated it. He was, he, there's a cautiousness there. Um, <clears throat> revealing our need for help, which is interesting, right? Like there's something about showing somebody else that you need them. You need their services. You appreciate their services. You appreciate something they're doing for you. It's, it shows dignity to that other person. It also shows that I'm just like you. I'm needy. And it gently pulls a person into a friendship. This is one of the interesting things about commerce. When you do commerce, people and exchange money and exchange services. Have you ever noticed that there, there becomes this connection? You think of, you know, the real intimate stuff. You know, I, I have a daughter that cuts people's hair. The stuff people tell her in that chair is... is <laughs> amazing. There's something about her touching somebody's head in a chair that opens them up to share all sorts of private stuff in their life. And you think about that in, in light of evangelism, there's something about that in us as Christians receiving that from somebody else, meaning, meaning they're offering something like this water and we take it. Yeah, let, let me have that. Let me have that service. There's something about waitresses and waiters and that service. There. It just opens a door and it, it develops an instant friendship with people. The stuff you can talk about around that kind of a setting is amazing. Conversations start at the other, perf uh, uh, start at the other person's concerns. There's something about asking people's questions. Tell me about your family. Tell me about your interests. Um, you know, you're, you're at a restaurant with somebody else, see somebody with a cross. Hey, I see you wearing a cross. Does that, does that, you know, is that just decoration or does that have some meaning for you? It's amazing what people will begin to tell you. And all of a sudden you're right into, a, you're right into the thing. Or people's concerns, they're talking about justice or injustice in the world. A lot of these, these hot button topics of our day. There's something about entering into that and asking questions of people. Not to needle them, not to you know drill them, because we just would disagree with a lot of the people's conclusions. But they're again, those are little doorways. When they're thinking about justice and morality, we've talked about this before. You know, when you see a gay pride parade, underneath that is it, in, it's 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 got a, a twisted, warped view, right? But they're they're thinking justice. They're thinking something is wrong, and we should have rights. That's that's a discussion about justice, for friends. I mean, think about it. It's an amazing discussion. Because you get, you're going to get right back to God real quick. 
Like, where do you get this standard, and how did you come up with this, and where is this coming from? But those things are laying out there every day in conversations with people, if you just look for them. Simple everyday life can be turned into spiritual lessons and doorways to the gospel, as we said. Just simple, the simplest things can be turned real quick. I'll tell you one story. I don't think I told it here yet. I don't think I told you the story about haagen ice cream, did I? I have this really embar- it's, it's really embarrassing, but you've got to laugh, okay? So, like, <laughs> I was a young guy, just married, and, you know, I was sharing my faith with people, and I stopped. I don't even know why I stopped. I could never afford it. It was one of these RVs, you know, like a trailer, and I don't know. I saw it, and I thought it was kind of cool, and I, I stopped, and I kind of was just poking around, looking inside of it, and the salesman comes out, and he, you know, of course, he wants to sell me on it now. Of course, I, he, I don't have a dime, you know. I'm just kind of looking. And he goes in, and he's looking around, he opens up the refrigerator, and he says, yeah, there's not much room in there, but there's, a, there's room in there for about a quart of haagen Now, you got to understand, at that moment, I didn't know what haagen was. I thought he was talking about some kind of liquor or something. And so, so I said, well, yeah, you know, I haven't touched that stuff <laughs> for a couple of years since I, you know, started this relationship with Christ. <laughs> and... <laughs> I'm embarrassed telling you the story now. And I think to this day, that guy's still thinking, I can't become a Christian because I can't eat ice cream. <laughs> and I didn't even know it till like months later, I was driving down a freeway and I saw the billboard for haagen and it was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so uh, I'll probably be in heaven with that guy, right? Won't that be cool if God turned that? <laughs> but... Hagen turned into a conversation about the gospel. I was able to share Christ with the guy. <laughs> uh, listening, understanding. Okay, listening and understanding people. There's something about repeating to people what they're thinking, even if it's wrong. Say, is this what you're saying? If I understand you right, this is what you're thinking. It brings gratitude and affection. <laughs> it learns what others think. And you see the doorways. And a, and a classic question, we'll get to more of this when we're talking about tactics in our class. But this is the classic question. This is a, this is a key one. What do you mean by that? When somebody says and makes a claim and they want to argue with you about something or say something, say, what do you, what do you mean by that? Like, like, explain that word to me. What, what are you getting at? And again, even like, you know, we talked earlier, you could say God. What do you mean by God? Really? You know, if I'm talking to somebody who's a Mormon, they actually have a different view of God than I do. They have a bit different view. Jesus, what, do you, what do you mean by God? What do you mean by Jesus? What do you mean by Allah? Allah is the Arabic word for, for God. What, what do you mean by that? You see, see how that works? You can have these conversations by just seeing these doorways, being affectionate, asking people, what do you mean by that? How do, I understand, how do you understand that? And what it does is it opens up a tw- 23 more doors that you can go right down. So those are some, uh, a few more observations. Nothing good or, or noticing good qualities and commending them gains respect. Again, this is the idea. You know, you served me really well today. I really appreciate that. There's something about noticing things in people that are good and right that acknowledges it. And you can do that with people. You can affirm people all day long, and it just opens all sorts of doors for conversation. I had a mechanic one time. I began to talk to him about, um, about the Lord, <coughs> and he said to me, um, you know, I think, I think Christians are a hypocrite, and I don't want any, really anything to do with that. And I said, well, you know, you, you sort of sound like Jesus. And he kind of looked at me. He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, Jesus had a real problem with people who pretended, who played games with religious ideas. And I said, he would have said the same thing. And he was like, really? I said, yeah, we ought to talk about that sometime. Really? Yeah, that would be a good idea. And then we ended up by going, and I don't remember, I think we went bowling or something, and he was into bowling. I said, let's go bowl. I wasn't, I wasn't even much of a bowler, but I said, let's go do that and, you know, had a burger or whatever. And we ended up having a whole t- conversation about the gospel. But it all started with him saying, I don't like that stuff because of the hypocrites. And me going, what do you mean by that? And me going down this road of talking about Jesus and hypocrite. Isn't that interesting? I mean, you can, again, th- these doorways are all around us. Uh, anticipate where the discussion is going. It's a little bit farther down the road. But there's some, a sense in which I think I know where this is going. I think I know where this is going to go and anticipating steps after that. Um, Avoid marginal issues. Focus on the gospel. I was thinking of examples with that, like with Roman Catholicism. You know, I don't honestly, you know, maybe somebody else feels like you should, and you guys, you know, work that out. But I don't get into, I talk about two fundamental things with Roman Catholics. One is authority, the word of God. I actually believe God actually spoke. And the second one is how is a person justified? 
No, we use that term here. But how's a person made right before God? I don't, I don't get on any of the other stuff. I don't talk about Mary. I don't talk about anything else. You know, if you want to talk to me about that, you can. But my point is that I want to get to the gospel because the power of God, the power of you know, salvation is in the gospel. And that's what we want to get to with people. And so it doesn't matter where, where we start and what we talk about. There's always this sense in your mind is the goal is to get to, you know, God, man, Christ, turn from your sin and trust Christ. That's, how does this get me there without getting sidetracked? <clears throat> the, talk, the call to turn from sin and trust Jesus, repentance. Even repentance, really, you think about repentance is the word to turn. Well, there's actually two, a couple turnings going on, right? We, we tend to think repent meaning sin, turn from your sin, which is true. But it's also a turning from who you thought, might have thought Jesus was and turning to who Jesus really is. That's why you can say repentance, the whole thing in one sense. Because that's what we're trying to get to. There comes this call. So even this great story we read of the adulterous woman, and again, we could really spend time preaching that, right, and unpacking that. But at the end, even after there's a dignity, even after he's dealing with these people's false accusations, all this stuff, he still calls the woman to turn from her sin. Right? When it's all said and done, that's what we have to do. So there's always a movement towards that. And then um, this thing that you see in all of these narratives that's really interesting how God gave us this word is early on the disciples realized they had been called to something much larger than their own salvation. There was always a sense of mission. Just like we see with the, the Samaritan woman, what's her first reaction? Go tell all her friends. And there's something for us in that as, as we evangelize people. As we, and I, I think I've said this before, but we're always looking at people through them to their people. There's a sense in which, yes, there's a personal aspect, but there's that person represents a whole world. And what you're stepping into is you're stepping into that world. It could be their family, their family kids, you know, their work partners. That's what you're stepping into. And we always are thinking that way. And so it, anyway, what happens out of that's really cool. So those are some thoughts about the sinful women. We have a few more minutes. Let's look at a couple others here then. Let's look at the John, uh, Luke, uh, Luke 5. We're going to look at these, the hated and the privileged. These are like tax collectors. You could say uh, some of the uh, study I was doing on this, publicans, you know, these, these you, could, you could even make it say politicians, public people who people hate, right? These are the hated and despised ones. So let's look at Luke 5, 27. Um, this is the calling of Matthew. Okay, verse 27, after this he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth. Luke chapter 5. And he said to him, same thing again, right? Follow me. Follow me. Didn't give him a lot of instruction. Didn't give him all the details. Somehow, again, in the mind of Jesus, he's God, so he knows what's going on. But he goes, follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. Left everything behind. <coughs> Luke clarifies that. He left everything. Walked away from everything. It's a pretty good indication something's going on, right? And Levi... Be and then Levi gave a big reception for him <coughs> in his house. In Levi's house, he said, we're going to have a big party at my house. And there was a great crowd. And who was the crowd? Tax collectors, right? And other people who were reclining at the table with him. Notice that? He had this big reception, and it wasn't just for the guys from the church. <laughs> he went and grabbed all his buddies, a bunch of pagans, bunch of tax collectors, a bunch of sinners, and says, we got to meet with this Jesus. What a cool picture. Wouldn't that be fun? I don't know. Maybe you all don't think it's fun. I think it would be awesome to walk in a room and say, introduce me to all your non-Christian friends. Let's have a dinner and have a conversation. What an opportunity. We, we, and we need to be thinking that way. We need to be thinking that way. So he gives, gives a big reception, and the Pharisees and their scribes begin what? Grumbling at his disciples. So first of all, they don't even talk to Jesus face to face. They talk to his disciples and they're grumbling. What are they grumbling about? Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Why do you hang out with those awful people? Right? And Jesus answered and said to them, it's not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know? And I get it. Meaning, 
as Christians, we come to faith in Christ and we see a world out there of pagan, sinful stuff, and some of it is, is pretty disgusting and repulsive to us. But brothers and sisters, we've been called to go to those people. We've been called to go reach those people with the gospel. And we can put up some big walls because we don't like them. And we need to be able to separate the individual people from an agenda. Right? The agenda, the, the ideology we should despise. But people are victims of that. Now, you know, they buy into it and they accept it and God holds them accountable. I got it. But we don't know who Jesus' sheep are. How many of those people marching in parades that we despise are his sheep? We, we're supposed to go to them. We're supposed to go to him, not judge that. 33, and they said to him, the disciples of John often fast and offer. Let's, let's skip over that for right now. He goes in this discussion, it's in all the Gospels, about fasting and prayer. And he's just basically fundamentally there for, for the sake of our discussion this morning. This whole idea of new wine, right? New people, new place. The old stuff, we need to go to new ground. And new people, and new wine, and it's fresh, and it's new. And there's something really wonderful when we see that person in that dark world come to faith in Christ, isn't it? I mean, it's a glorious story. It's awesome. So go with me to another one quick. Um, go to uh, chapter 19 of Luke. This is our wee little man. The wee little man is he, right? Zacchaeus. A great song. <laughs> oh, okay, verse, uh, chapter 19. Let's go to verse 1. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. He's kind of the boss of tax collectors, and he was rich. We think Matthew was probably rich, too. Tax collectors had a lot of money. But definitely here it says he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was. Now, interesting, here's a guy. He wants to see Jesus. And he was unable to because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see Jesus. Because Jesus was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Follow me. Let's go, Zacchaeus. And what's he do? He hurried, came down, and received him gladly. Conversion, right? I mean, it's just so simple, but it's like he knew Zacchaeus wanted to connect to him. He knew it. He saw it, right? When people show up at our stuff, they're looking. And again, that's the idea. And we'll get into tactics more in weeks to come. But that's the idea when we do even a little more public things. Maybe there's a discussion on a campus, you know, some panel or Wesco Beach or all these things that we're doing or events in the church. The whole idea behind that is to find these individual sheep. That's why we do that. It's like throwing out a net broadly or throwing out all of this stuff broadly. And you're looking for people who are popping their heads up, you know. Uh, when Will Moneymaker and I would regularly go to the jail, I mean, it's like this invitation. Hey, come to this, come, come to this Bible study. And part of the fact that the guys even walk through the door says something. Says they're looking for something. Maybe they want time out of their cell. I'm even fine with that because the gospel is so powerful. In fact, the story on that is, uh, and again, I don't remember all the stories I tell in here, but um, one of the men I travel with in Ethiopia, Shafero, he was, a, um, he was uh, part of the Communist Party as a young man. And he would go to churches and create disruption. He would break windows, and then they would go into the services, and they would scream and yell and mock the pastors. Well, he was there with his buddies doing that at one service. Except the guy that week was a guest speaker, and he was preaching the gospel. And the end of the story is, all the buddies left. Why are you staying, Shafiro? Oh, I want to hear what he has to say. And Shafiro came to faith in Christ there in that meeting. And then they ended up by throwing him in prison, and he was beaten and tortured because they wanted him to return to the Communist Party. It's a long story. But the fascinating thing is, you know, you offer people these opportunities because you're looking for Jesus' sheep. Where are they? Where are the ones lifting their heads? Okay? So Zacchaeus, he calls him by name. That's another great little tip. Get to know people's names. Waitress, somebody waiting on you. Hey, what's your name? Do you guys ever notice that? Don't you like to be called by your name? There's something about that. When somebody calls you your actual name and you remember it, you come back to a place. I go to the same gas stations over and over, and I call people. Hey, Richard, how you doing today? 
It's instant. You're connected to these people just by getting a name. Jesus calls them by name. Again, this idea of dignity. And then, I must stay at your house. There's something about going to somebody's home or them coming to your home. Again, it's a natural movement. I'm always asking, you know, like how many, do you have people in your home? Are you hospitable? Do you, do you connect to people? Do you say, hey, let's get together sometime for a cup of coffee. Let's get together sometime for, for breakfast. I mean, that, that's real. That's like, like, you do that with people. It's amazing the doors that open when you, if you'll connect with people like that. Um, he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to, what they do again? Grumble. Saying, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. Sounds like repentance, doesn't it? There's something going on, right? That's real. It's so real. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. You see that? Even that response of the man... <coughs> He believed clearly. He said, Jesus, come to my home. <clears throat> and then when he says, I'm going to give everything back, it's clearly a demonstration of repentance. Repentance. So again, let's just look at some, just a handful of observations. I took this right out of a book I've been studying on some of this discussion. And I, liked, I, I just like the quote, a zealous soul winner will always be criticized by some for mingling with sinners. To pious legalists, such conduct appears scandalous. Hanging out with the wrong kind of people. There's a place to do it. Again, with propriety, with carefulness, with cautiousness. But there's a place to do it. There's a place to hang out. Be aware of spiritual interest in the midst of our routine in life. That's what I've been telling you. You're looking for these doorways. I can't say that enough. You'll find people who have a spiritual interest. I had a guy one time stopped at my house to fill my LP tank. And um, he... Uh, I, I asked him, do you ever think about spiritual things? Yeah, it's something I don't like to talk to anybody about. And I'm like, really, why? <laughs> <laughs> we talked for the next 30 or 40 minutes. Seriously. I've, had, I've, I've done that so many times to people. Tell me, you don't like to talk about stuff. Why? Boom, off they go. That's <laughs> so all you got to say. They'll tell you. They'll tell you, oh, they're, you know, they went to a church and it was a terrible experience and this thing and that thing and this thing and that thing. And Man, you can turn it right into the gospel. Going to someone's home is one of the best ways to single them out, to affirm them, or have them in your home, too. There's something about that, right? That you've, you've got into a, a, an intimate space, to, if you want to use that word. Maybe that's too strong a word, but you guys know what I mean. There's something about that. People must feel wanted and loved in our presence. They will want to be around us. A lot of times we alienate people. Sometimes you can't help it. I mean, that's just life. But we need to work real hard at, at this reality of uh, loving people. I remember one time at, um, I was up in the campus at Wesco Beach and having this, they call it Wesco Beach up there, and we're having these open air conversations, and people wanted to heckle and fight. And I remember one point saying, guys, listen, I'm just a local guy. I just want to have a conversation with you guys. I mean, really, like literally afterwards, if you guys want to go for a burger and your favorite beverage, I would do it with you just to hang out and talk about this stuff. And it just calmed the whole thing down. And when I got done, I had a guy come up to me afterwards, and I forget, he's like, I'm a fifth year senior here, I'm studying some master's degree, something or other, and he says, you know, this stuff needs to happen more often here. He says, I don't even agree with what you're talking about, but this was just like awesome. Yeah, well, I'm not here to fight with anybody. I'm not here to, you know, shout down to you. I'm here to, like, engage you on this conversations, right? Which is a demonstration of love, of care. Today is the day of salvation. We shouldn't be afraid to go there. Today. You gotta think about this today. Like you need to turn from your sin and trust Christ today. I mean, this isn't just a theory thing to go th think about. You have a right to go think about it. But like, I'm calling you today. Today is the day of salvation. A, pub a public ap appeal to identify with Christ can be a very powerful thing. You know, I mean, Jesus, Zacchaeus, come on, right in front of everybody. There's something about that. There's something about asking people, why don't you trust Christ today, right in front of people. I mean, there's a conversation going on. He's got friends around saying, I have a question for you. You've heard all this. Why wouldn't you turn from your sin and trust Christ today? You can do that with people. A couple more thoughts. Restitution can be a good indication of sincere repentance, right? We're seeing that. There's something about that. Individuals have different theological needs. Some things do not require elaboration. Others need to be clarified. 
And I, that's the same thing I told you earlier. There's a sense with some things you don't even have to dwell on. Just go past it. Get to the gospel. Just go. Now, there's other times an individual person, it really is a big hang-up for them, right? They're really struggling with something, and you want to say, well, I think I have some answers about that. Let's talk about that. <laughs> and then, this is a classic old statement that we've used, start where they are and beeline towards the cross, right? Start where they are, but you always want to get to the gospel. You always want to go to the gospel, and you want to be thinking in those terms. How does this get me to the gospel? Whenever they ask me something, my first reaction is like, I wonder how that question gets me to the gospel. <clears throat> okay. That is it. It's 10.15. We went through some more narratives. I hope you'll go home and read these passages and just meditate on them and think about them. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to be gone shortly. Uh, we'll, I'll be back to do some more of this, and some of the other guys will be fitting in, too. So blessings to you, my friends. Let's have a great worship this morning in about 15 minutes. And so keep interacting. God bless you.